Let me remind you that, uh, uh, to summarize a little bit where we were uh, last time at the end of the hour, uh, we're in the process of looking for representations of classical rotations. These are actually proper rotations only, but deal with improper rotations later on. Uh, representations of proper rotations in terms of operators, U, which uh, uh, act on the uh, Hilbert space of some quantum system that represent the rotations. And we require that these operators U should satisfy the three properties listed here. First of all, they should be unitary. Secondly, the U operator corresponding with the identity rotation should be the identity operator. And thirdly, the U operator should reproduce the multiplication law of the classical rotations. This is just a list of requirements that we wrote down. Now, as you might, have meant, you might imagine, the uh, U operators that we eventually get are going to depend on the specific nature of the system, whether it's a spin system or relativistic quantum field theory, it's going to make a difference. However, uh, there's an awful lot of the properties of these U operators that can be derived independent of that that actually only depend on these representation uh, uh, properties or requirements that I've listed here. So we're going to explore those first, and then later we'll look at how specifically these operators are generalized in specific systems. Okay, so to begin with, let me remind you that a classical rotation can be written in axis angle form, and that this is also has an exponential form, which is e to the theta times n hat dotted into this vector of three by three matrices that I'm writing a script j on the board, and it appears as a Samson font in the, in the notes, <coughs> like this. And um, you may notice that this, uh, that this axis angle parameter parameterization actually only depends on the product of the angle times the uh, axis unit vector. If I draw a picture here, here's the unit vector in hat, and by extending it, I get the axis of the rotation, and the geometrical ideas of the angle theta is used here as a right-hand rule giving it a rotation. But since it only, the, the answer only appears in this product, it suggests that we make a definition of a vector of angles, let me call it theta vector, which is just defined as theta angle scalar times, times the unit vector in hat. And if we do this, then this theta vector is along the direction of the axis like this, and it has a magnitude which is equal to the angle of rotation. So it's just notation, that's all. And so if we do this, then let's just define an alternative notation for these rotation operators as R of the, of the, of the vector of angles theta. And this is the same thing as e to the theta vector dotted into this script J vector of three by three matrices like that. So somewhat simple notation. All right. Now, as long as we're talking notation, let's also talk about the corresponding unitary operators. Uh, let's let u, u is supposed to be parameterized by r, so let's write r in axis angle form, r in atomic theta, and let's just define this in kind of an obvious notation, the u of n hat atomic theta, it's in axis angle form for the unitary operators. Or if we write the r in terms of this vector of angles, uh, theta vector up here, this becomes u of r of theta vector, and again, in kind of an obvious notation, let's write that as u of theta vector. This is just notation, that's all. All right, to go back to the problem here, the main problem is that we'd like to find these unitary operators subject to these three constraints, given the fact that we know about the classical rotations. The main strategy for doing this is to work on infinitesimal rotations first. So, let me remind you that if R is an infinitesimal rotation, in fact, I'll write it out in this theta vector notation here, because we have an exponential series for it, if we expand it out, it looks like this, it becomes the identity plus theta vector dotted in with our script J, J vector matrices plus high order terms. So, that's the infinitesimal angle version of this. Um, now, as far as the U's are concerned, Let's look at u of theta vector. We don't really know anything about these things yet, except that they're unitary. But we can, uh, certainly if the angle is small, we can, we're free to expand this in a Taylor series. So let's write this as u of 0, plus the first correction term is going to be the sum from k equals 1 to 3 of theta sub k, the three components of theta. Let me make my signal look better. Three components of theta times the derivative of u with respect to theta sub k, evaluated at 0, plus higher order terms like this, just expanding the Taylor series. Now, um, you may remember we did something similar to this in the case of translation operators, and in fact I'm going to follow the same general pattern that we used earlier with translation operators. 
first of all, as far as the view of zero is concerned, that's equal to one. It's kind of obvious that if the operator is near identity, then it's got to be close to the identity operator. So if rotation is near identity, then you has to be close to the identity operator in quantum mechanics, which we just call one here. As far as the first correction term is concerned, it involves these coefficients, which are the derivatives of you with respect to theta evaluated at zero. One thing to notice about these derivatives is they don't depend on theta. They're actually just constant operators. This is quite different from u over here, which is a function of three angles. So let's, let's look at these first derivatives and making a box to separate things off here. Uh, let's make a definition. I'll put the definition up here. Uh, we'll define a new set of operators, which I'll call capital J sub k. This is a Roman k and not a script k. This appears in a different font of the notes. Capital Roman, uh, excuse me, Roman J instead of script J. Uh, this is defined as minus i h bar times the derivative of u with respect to theta sub k evaluated at zero. It's just proportional to this first Taylor series of coefficient, that's all. In fact, what we've done in defining j sub k is to first of all split off a factor of minus i. The reason we do that is that it makes j sub k permission. This is something I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, come back to in just a moment, but that's what the minus i does, is it makes it remission. And secondly, we split off a factor of h bar, which is really just conventional. But you'll recall we did something like that also in the translation operators as well. Uh, however, splitting off the h bar means you can see that the u is dimensionless, b u v theta is dimensionless, since theta is dimensionless. It means that j has the same dimensions as h bar, which is action, or otherwise it has dimensions of angular momentum. And in fact, we will call this the angular momentum of the system. Now, uh, in doing this, we're following rather closely, once again, uh, what we did in the case of translation operators. So you'll recall that we defined the linear momentum of the quantum system as being the generator of translations. And likewise here, we're defining the angular momentum as the generator of rotations in the same sense. It's the permission operator that's involved in a near identity, uh, uh, a near identity symmetry operation. Uh, I'll come back to the why this is called angular momentum in, 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 in a moment, but uh, let, me, let me go on with this. For right now, this is just a substitution. But if we apply this to this u of theta here, this expression here, what we find is that for small angles, we find that u of theta vector is equal to identity minus i over h bar times theta vector dotted into now this Roman j, which is our make which is our vector of operators. Or if I go back to the axis angle notation using where, where it is, theta vector is theta times n hat, this just becomes one minus i over h bar times the angle of theta times the axis n hat dotted into j plus higher order terms. All right. Now, in the case of the rotations, the classical rotations, this uh, small angle representation of the classical rotations is really just the first term of the Taylor series. And the, if you sum it up, you get the exponential, which you see up here. But the question is, can we do some similar summation here? Right now, all we have for our U operator is the first term of the Taylor series. But can we carry out a summation? of the entire series? And the answer is yes, and it follows the same pattern that we used earlier for deriving this exponential notation. Actually, we used it uh, at least a couple of times before, once in connection with the translation operators. And let me go through it now to derive an exponential form for u of n, n hat comma theta, when theta is not necessarily small, when we want the higher order terms. It works like this. Let's take u of n hat comma theta, and let's look for a differential equation for it, which we'll write as dv theta starting out with, we ask for the derivative with respect to theta. By the definition of the derivative, this is the limit as epsilon goes to zero of u of n hat comma theta plus epsilon minus u of n hat comma theta divided by epsilon, limit form for derivative. Now, the first factor of u of n hat theta plus epsilon because of the fact that the U operators reproduce the multiplication law of the classical rotations, this means that this is equal to U of n hat comma epsilon times U of n hat comma theta, because that's the same rule that the classical rotations obey. And so you can factor out a U of n hat comma theta out to the right, right side, and this becomes the limit as epsilon goes to zero 
of u of n hat comma epsilon minus identity divided by epsilon, that whole limit multiplied on the right by u of n hat comma theta, like this. Now, as far as that derivative, excuse me, as far as this limit is concerned, we can easily get that from our small angle formula. This formula here is valid at at this point. The formula is valid when theta is small. So writing epsilon instead of theta, I've got a valid expression here for this. If I pl plug this in, subtract the 1, it kills the 1 here. Divide by epsilon, it'll kill the theta, which is being replaced by epsilon. And what's left over is nothing but minus i over h bar times n hat dotted into, into j in the angular momentum. And so, to make a little space here, we get a differential equation that says d of u of n hat comma theta with respect to theta is equal to minus i over h bar n hat dotted into j times u of n hat comma theta. And of course, the initial conditions is that it has to equal 1 when theta is equal to 0. And so we integrate this, and what we get uh, is, I'll put it right over here, is we get the solution, which is the u of n hat comma theta is equal to e to the minus i over h bar times n hat dotted into j. And this is the exponential form for the unitary, uh, unitary operators which uh, represent uh, represent rotations of x sample form. Now this isn't a solution yet to our problem. Our problem is to find the u operators that correspond to the given classical rotations. And we haven't solved the problem, we've just merely re-expressed it. There should be a theta in there. Theta times in that dotted into j. We haven't solved the problem exactly because we don't actually know what the j's are. The j's are defined in terms of the u's, you see, up here are the first derivatives. But this is a great improvement over the original problem because the original u operators depended on three continuous parameters here. And now you see those continuous parameters have been, the dependence on them is indicated explicitly right here in the exponent. And what's left over are the j's, which are just three operators, three only, three operators only that are independent of any parameters. So the, this changes our strategy. In order to find the u's, what we're going to do is first try to find the j's. There's only three of them, and they don't depend on the thetas. Once we find them, then we form this exponential, and that will give us the u's. Okay. So in order to do that, we need to know what the properties of the j's are. Something to replace this list of properties of the u's here. We need to know what the properties of the j's are so that we know what we're looking for in finding the j's. Well, one of the properties of the j's is the derivation. I mentioned that up here, but I didn't prove it. Let me uh, just indicate a little bit of space here, how the proof goes. Uh, it's exactly the same as what we did in the case of, uh, of a momentum operator when we were working with treating momentum as generator translations. What we do is we just go back to the infinitesimal version, small angle version of the, of the operator. You require that u times u dagger is equal to the identity, and a direct consequence of that is that jk is equal to jk dagger. Uh, I won't actually go through the details of this because it's exactly the same as what we did earlier with the translation operators. But in any case, one of the properties of the J operators, the angular momentum, is that these are uh, these are uh, addition operators. Now, so let's summarize here what the properties are of the, of the uh, angular momentum. The angular momentum is a vector of operators. So the first one is, is that the permission. There's three of them. They don't depend on angles or axes or anything. They're just fixed operators. Maybe another one dimensional. I'll skip number two in a minute. Let's go back to number three. Number three is maybe the most important one. Is, is that is that a U a unitary rotation operator is expressed in terms of the angular momentum by this relation. Do the I over H bar theta and then have about it into, into square J. Uh, for number two, it turns out what we're, what we're going to want are the commutation relations of the angular momentum operators. I'll have to fill this in. Perhaps you recall when we did translations, we used the properties of the translation operators to deduce the commutation relations of the momenta, and we found the momentum operators had to commute with one another. We're going to do something similar to that now. We're going to use the properties of rotations 
define the commutators of the angular momentum defined in this way. Um, the story of this, so I want to concentrate on item number two now. The story of this goes back to uh, what we did earlier on my summary board and what we did earlier with classical rotation. Let me remind you, in studying the commutativity of classical rotations, we look at this product of a product of A, B, A inverse, B inverse, where the A and the Bs are rotation operators, R1 and R2, each of which has an axis and an angle like this. So their exponentials of anti-symmetric matrices are called A1 and A2, in kind of an obvious notation. And what we did was we expanded out the Taylor series for this four-way this four product, and we got the result that looked like this. So in particular, if, uh, if, 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 if the first rotation is about the x-axis and the second rotation is about the y-axis, and if the angles are small, then the first order correction of this, of this product here is a rotation about the z-axis, because it's got a cross product of the two unit vectors there. Yes? Um, is there a sign error up there? Should that be jk equals positive values or z equals negative? Uh, 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 yes, you're quite right. Excuse me. Yes, you're very worried about minus signs. The minus sign appears here, but not, not, not there. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yes, absolutely. All right. Uh, and by the way, that follows the same signs that we did uh, in the case of linear momentum. Now, um, uh, yes. So, uh, so the this this is this matrix C, especially for small angles, is an interesting way of examining how rotations don't commute. Now, uh, in order to find the commutators of the angular momentum operators, which is now on this on the board that's coming up, this item number two that we're interested in here, what I'm, I'm going to do is, is to concentrate on the rotation operators that correspond to these, these ro rotations here and the rotation C. So let's do it this way. Maybe before I do that, however, let me uh, do one more thing, which is to take this result here and let's write this in the form. It's obviously a small, if they don't want to take it to a small, this is obviously a near identity rotation. Let's write this in the form of identity plus, let's call it phi times impact, rather than j, because if we do that, this is the beginning of the series of the rotation operator about the axis impact by an angle phi. And you can see just by comparing this expression with that one, we see that phi times impact is just equal to theta 1 theta 2 times n hat 1 cross n hat 2. And as I mentioned, if, so for example, if n hat 1 is x hat, n hat 2 is y hat, then m hat is z hat, and phi is the product of the two small angles. That's an example of this. All right, now, uh, I guess since I've got this stuff here, I'll do the calculation on this board, and then I'll go back to our summary board and put the results on. So the strategy here then is to look at the unitary operators that correspond to this product. So we're going to, we're going to look at U of C, and we're going to compute this in two different ways. One way is to just write it because because the because these unitary operators have to reproduce the, the multiplication law. This must be U of R1 times U of R2 times U of R1 inverse, which is the same as U of, U of R1 dagger times U of R2 inverse u of r2 dagger, like this. <coughs> However, r1 and r2 are written in axis angle form, like this. So this becomes the same thing as u of n hat 1 comma theta 1 times u of n hat 2 comma theta 2 times u of n hat 1 comma theta 1 dagger times u of n hat 2 comma theta 2 dagger. And we now have exponential series for all four of these. So we can multiply this out. The first one becomes 1 minus i over h bar, theta 1, times n hat 1 dotted into angular momentum operator j. The second order term is minus 1 over 2 h bar squared times theta 1 squared times n hat 1 dotted into angular momentum j quantity squared plus higher order terms. Cutting this out the second order. That's for the first factor here. And then this gets multiplied times the other three factors. And I won't bother to write out all the details, but you can easily fill in the series for them. 
and you do the multiplication, and you carry out the algebra out to second order, and at lowest order you get one, and at first order you get zero, because all the first order terms cancel. And at second order, what you will find is for the minus sign is one over uh, eight, one over h bar squared times uh, theta one times theta two times the commutator of n hat one dotted into j with n hat two dotted into j in plus high order third order terms. First non vanishing terms at second order. Now, on the other hand, C itself here is a near identity uh, rotation, which we've written here in terms of this M and phi stuff. So the answer must be equal to 1 minus i over h bar m hat times, let's put this one, phi times m hat dotted into the angular momentum because it's a near identity rotation operator. The phi times m hat is theta 1 beta 2 times m hat 1 cross m hat 2. So this becomes 1 minus i over h bar theta 1 theta 2 times n hat 1 cross into n hat 2 <coughs> dotted into the angular momentum plus high order terms like this. So as I say, we evaluate this u of c in two different ways. And what we're using is just the representation laws up there. That's the only thing we're using. These two terms that the order of theta 1, theta 2 have to be equal to one another. You can think of this as a double Taylor series in these two variables, theta 1 and theta 2. So in setting these two terms equal, we can cancel the theta 1 and theta 2. And then the rest, let me just multiply this by both terms by minus h bar squared. And the result will be this, is that the commutator of n hat 1 dotted into j with n hat 2 dotted into j is equal to i h bar times n hat 1 cross n hat 2 dotted into j. So, for example, if we let n hat 1 be x hat and n hat 2 be y hat, then n hat 1 cross n hat 2 is z hat, and we see the commutator of jx with jy is equal to i h bar jz. Or, more generally, to put it into a uh, form that we'll use. Let me go back to my summary here, the answer is that this becomes i h bar times epsilon i j k j c k. And thus we derive the commutation relations for the angular momentum in this manner. So to recapitulate a little bit where we are with this, so uh, to go back to the step of to summarize the step we just went through. We use, the, we use the commutation properties of the classical rotations plus these representation rules in order to derive the commutation relations of the generators of rotations in quantum mechanics. And this is what we get, is this result. Um, the standard way of deriving the angular momentum commutation relations in introductory courses is to start with the orbital angular momentum, which is r cross p. It's usually r cross p for kinetic plus potential problems. And then you work out the commutators of that, you the commutators of x and p, and you get these, these standard relations. Then later on, when you come to spin, you say, well, spin should have the same commutation relations because it's another angular momentum and it should be the same as orbital. And that's the usual logic that's used. Here, we're, we're following a different logic. We're deriving the commutation relations of the angular momentum essentially from the properties of rotations. This gets to the essence of the matter really in a better way because these commutation relations really follow from the geometry of Euclidean space. It really comes from nothing else. And as you, it, goes, it goes all the way back to the commutation relations of, of, the, of, these, of these J matrices in, in, in the classical rotation, which in turn are related to their, their more rotation matrices. So that's the real meaning lying behind this is geometry of three dimensional space. Another thing to say is, is that the angular momentum, even in classical mechanics, is not always r cross p, as you saw in this monopole problem. So it isn't even general to do this. This is a general definition of, of, uh, of the angular momentum as a generator of rotations. And it applies not only for problems with uh, orbital mechanics, uh, kinetic plus potential problems, but also problems with spin, problems with magnetic fields. Uh, for example, you can apply it to relativistic problems, you can field theory, you can get the angular momentum of electromagnetic field all the same way. It's the same, same uh, procedures all the way through. All right. 
Now, in terms of how this fits into our strategy of trying to find unitary operators which represent rotations, what we've done is we've simplified the problem considerably because now instead of trying to find an arbitrary u, depending on three parameters, we only need to find just a, a three vector of emission operators that satisfy these commutation relations. And then when we find them, we just form this exponential, and this gives us our operators, which reproduce the classical multiplication laws of rotations. Now, that doesn't mean that they're, that they're rotation operators in a physical sense. So what we have to then have to do is to check and see that it makes sense physically. But anyway, that's the strategy that we use for finding these rotation operators. Now, at this point, I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, carry out that actual strategy uh, in the simplest possible system, which is that of the case of the spin one half system. Uh, of course, you know something about spin one half systems already from your undergraduate course, but I think for most of what I'm going to say here, you only need to think back to the story we went through earlier with the stern gerlach apparatus, where we use the experimental data and the postulates of quantum mechanics and we, in effect, derive the poly matrices. Uh, so let me remind you that Powell matrices satisfy the computation relations of sigma i sigma j is equal to twice i epsilon i j k sigma k. These are almost the same as the, as the uh, computation relations that we require for the angular momentum. And so what we do is we guess that in the first spin one half system, the angular momentum should be identified with h bar of the two times sigma. The reason we do that is because if we make this substitution, then these commutation relations are satisfied, and they're also permission. So they satisfy properties one and two. And if that's true, then what we get for the rotation operators, as put in an axis angle form for a spin one half system, would be equal to E, just plugging this h bar of two sigma here in, 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 into, into this where j appears here, the h bars are cancel, you get a two in the denominator becomes either minus i theta over 2 times impact dotted in the sigma. Well, this is an exponential which was on homework number 1. And the answer, if you expand out the series, becomes cosine theta over 2 minus i times impact dotted in the sigma times sine theta over 2. And that only blocks the whole thing because in <coughs> one half systems, this turns out to be rotation operator. Now, I have to say, I'm confusing a little bit the operator with the matrix, which represents the operator in a, in a, in a sigma z basis, but that's, that's a simple, simple thing to not be confused about. Uh, here is really matrices on the right hand side, whereas well, on the left I've got the operator, so I'll gloss over that difference and just identify the two. All right, anyway, um, so these are the matrices. Now, uh, probably the first question to ask is whether it makes sense physically in terms of a rotation. So uh, to, uh, uh, to discuss this, let's go back to the magnetic moment vector operator, which appeared in the stern gerlach apparatus. If we have a specific quantum state, and we take the expectation value, uh, the state psi here belongs to the open space of the spin one half system, then what results is just a number. The mean is, is, a, is a vector of operators, but what results is a vector of numbers, just ordinary numbers. Now, let's apply a, uh, a, uh, a rotation operator to the state psi, and let's call this the state psi prime. And if we form the expectation value of the magnetic moment operator with respect to the state psi prime, like this, this gives us another vector of ordinary three numbers. And so what should be the relationship of the expectation value of magnetic moment in the unrotated state versus the magnetic moment in the rotated state? Well, it's obvious that if this is reasonable physically, this should be the classical rotation multiplying the unrotated vector. In other words, expectation value should transform by the classical rotations. This is R, assuming we have room here, this is really R impact on the theta with the same axis and angle as appears in this U. Should be that. Well, if this is so, all I need to do is to substitute in psi prime is equal to U psi in here. Let me, and then also, let's, to simplify things a little bit, let's notice that U is proportional, some constant is proportional to the poly matrix sigma, as we found in earlier work. And so the result, the result that we get is this, is we get that psi 
times u dagger sigma times u psi should be equal to the rotation matrix multiplying psi sigma psi. I want you to understand the notation here. When I say the rotation matrix, this expectation value is an ordinary three vector of numbers. So I'm just multiplying the matrix times a vector of the usual sense of matrix multiplication. If, it, if that's not clear, uh, well, let's see. Before I go to that, let me just say that this equation has to be true for all size. So we can strip the size from both sides. And again, the requirement is that u dagger sigma u must be equal to r times sigma. If you explain more exactly what this means, <coughs> it means that u dagger times one of the components of sigma u i u must be equal to sum of j of r i j sigma j. So as I said, uh, the significance of this equation is, I haven't shown this is true yet, but this is what we expect that a reasonable a definition of a unitary rotation operator should satisfy this, this result. So what we need to do is to check to see whether our, our, uh, our tentative, uh, our provisional definition of a rotation operator actually does satisfy this result. Well, this is straightforward to do, is to write this out. If I take u dagger, all it's going to do is change the minus side to the plus side. So what we get here is we get cosine of theta over 2 plus i times impact of sigma times sine theta over 2 times sigma i, like this, times cosine theta over 2 uh, minus i impact dot sigma times sine theta over 2. This is equal to, we have to the question mark because we want to check it, sum on j of rij times sigma j. So this is the formula we need to check. Now the left hand side looks kind of complicated, but it's got a sigma here, a sigma there, and a sigma there. So the worst that happens is the product of three sigmas. A lot of terms only have two sigmas. The cosine times that sigma times that one. Some terms that only have one, it's cosine times that, cosine times that sigma. Okay, so you can use the, you can use the rules of the sigmas, like sigma i sigma j is delta ij plus i epsilon ij a sigma k. The multiplication rules for sigma that allow you to take a product and reduce it to a linear term. Likewise, you can take a cubic term and reduce it to a linear term. So there's algebra to do all of that, which I'll leave as an exercise for you. But when you're done, what you find is, the equivalent of the following is you find uh, you find the I work with the vector notation here as you see here rather than the index form as you see in the line below. You work in the vector notation here's what you find. You find the left hand side becomes cosine theta times sigma plus one minus cosine theta times n hat times n hat dotted into sigma plus sine theta times n hat cross sigma. That's the result of the algebra. And the question is, is this equal to R acting on sigma, rotating sigma? The U that appeared here is the axis angle form, so I should really write this as R again on the theta times sigma. And the question is, is, is this true? Well, it is true, because I'll remind you that Way back when we started looking at classical rotations, we worked out a formula of what the rotation does to any vector in these three terms. And they're reproduced exactly by this, this, uh, this provisional definition of rotations for spin lineup systems. And so it checks, it works. And that means that it satisfies the, the, the physical requirements that the rotation operators should have on spin lineup systems, mainly that expectation values of vector operators should transform as vectors, where the expectation values transformed by the classical rotations. All right. So the main result here is the one that I've got boxed at the top. This is uh, now, now becomes uh, a satisfactory definition of rotation operators for spin lineup systems. systems by guessing the angular momentum 
based on the commutation relations, and then just working it out. Um, the, uh, the two most important results on this upper board here, well, aside from the summary of properties of J, one is the explicit representation of the rotation operators for spin have systems here. But also, there's this expression over here for what happens when you conjugate sigma by a, by a, uh, a, uh, a, a unitary rotation operator. Let me uh, repeat that down here because this is an important result. And to make it explicit, U depends on in hat uh, uh, and theta. So U in hat theta dagger times sigma times U of in hat comma theta is equal to R of in hat comma theta multiplying sigma. This is an important formula that gets used, that gets used over and over again. This is the, uh, what I'll call the adjoint formula for, uh, for, for spin, spin rotations, just to give it a name. I'll remind you the adjoint formula we had in the case of classical rotations was this. If we took an A hat dotted into our script J vector, this is an anti-symmetric matrix, and conjugated by a rotation, this is the same thing as rotating the vector. And this has the geometrical meaning that the axis of a rotation transforms as a vector. This is the first term in the, in the expression for an infinite, first correction term in the expression for an infinitesimal rotation. And it, geometrically, it means, as I said, the axis of the rotation transforms as a vector. Uh, I'll, I want to show you now how this adjoint formula looks like this one. To do that, I want to do two things. Uh, first of all, let's take both sides of this equation and dot with some ordinary three vector A. So the dot appears here and on, over there on the, on, this, on the vector on the right hand side. But let me also take the U and replace it by U inverse so that R gets replaced by R inverse. So if I do this on the left hand side, I get U of N hat comma theta without a dagger times A dotted in the sigma times U of N hat theta dagger is equal to A dotted into uh, not R sigma, but rather R inverse sigma. because I replace R by R inverse. So this is a formula that's just equivalent to the line above. Now when you have a dot product like this and you've got a rotation multiplying one side of the dot product, you can shift it over to the other side and you replace the rotation by its inverse. That's because the inverse is the transpose and going from one side of the dot product to the other. You take the so this is the same thing as R of N hat comma theta without the inverse multiplying A dotted into sigma. When I write it like that, you can see that it has the same structure as we see up here, except the J, the, ge the generator of classical rotation is replaced by the sigma. And in conjugating the sigma, we need to use the U operators because that's a quantum generator. But the sigma as a vector transforms by the classical, or the axis transforms by the classical rotation. Anyway, I only went through that to show you why I'm calling both these formulas adjoint formulas. They, they really convey very similar information. Now, there's one problem which is left uh, about speaking still of spin one half rotations. There's one problem which is, is left. And this arises if we think about an axis, let's say here, in that angle beta rotation like this. And we want to apply a rotation about the axis in hat by an angle. Let's make the angle 2 pi so that it's a complete rotation of angle around 2 pi. And let's, let's apply this to some quantum state, which means a two-component spinner. Well, look at the middle of the board up there. Theta is equal to 2 pi, cosine of theta over 2 is cosine of pi, which is minus 1. And sine theta over 2 is sine of pi, which is 0. So u of n hat comma 2 pi is minus 1. On the other hand, if I take u of n hat comma 0, this is, of course, equal to plus 1. And if I square the first line, u of n hat 2 pi, to get u of n hat comma 4 pi, that becomes plus 1. So there's a problem here because uh, we were uh, imagining, it's been a race now, we were imagining, we started out by trying to find a mapping from the classical rotations into the, the association between this is what we call a representation 
of the classical rotations in terms of unitary rotation operators. Well, R of n hat comma 2 pi is equal to R of n hat comma 0, which is equal to the identity. And we were requiring that U of identity should be equal to plus 1. So U of n hat comma 2 pi should be equal to plus 1 if we have an association like this. But what we're finding is that U of n hat comma 2 pi is equal to minus 1. So although we follow the rules that were listed by this set of demands that we imposed, the answer doesn't actually work, work. It actually doesn't work because of this. Most of it works, but this doesn't. So we have to address this issue. There's two aspects to it. There's a mathematical aspect and a physical one. Let me address the mathematical aspect first. What's going on here is that instead of finding an association between a classical rotation and a corresponding unitary operator, which acts in our quantum system, in the case of a spin one half system, we're finding that a single classical rotation, which is mainly the identity, actually corresponds to two spin rotations, plus one and minus one. Here's a way of looking at this. If I take the space of classical rotations, this is the group SO3, and I have the identity here, it's one of them, then let's over here take the space of spin rotations. This is the space of matrices that look like this in the middle box up on the board there. And what we're finding is, is that instead of this rotation corresponding to a specific spin rotation, which is, would be, your guess would be plus one, we're finding it actually corresponds to two of them. It's plus one and minus one, or over at two operators. And so instead of having an association that works this way, this isn't really right, so it'd be a double, so it's a double value function in effect. It's more appropriate to look at it as going the other way. It's to say that there's not an association between classical rotations and spin rotations, but the other way, given a spin rotation, you can find the classical rotation. The set of spin rotations, by the way, is a set of two by two matrices that look like this. And these matrices all have the property that, first of all, were unitary, but that was by construction. Also the property that their determinant is plus one. You can just check that by taking the determinant of that equation, writing out the poly matrices. In any case, what that means is, is that all of these spin rotations belong to the group SU2. This is mathematical language for the space of unitary matrices which have a determinant plus one. That's just what it means. And in fact, every SU2 matrix is, in fact, a matrix of this form. It is a spin rotation. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between spin rotations and SU2 matrices. And that's, in fact, what this set of spin rotations is. It's the group SU2. And it does not stand in one-to-one -one correspondence with the classical rotations. It stands in two-to-one correspondence. And thus, although we started out by saying that u is a function of r, it's actually more appropriate to think of r as a function of u. So if you have any u, I can find a specific r. By the way, if I take any other r besides the identity, this will map over here into two rotations, and their u and minus should be always different by a sign, plus and minus sign. So it's r is equal to r of u. This is the same thing as r of minus u. OK. It's possible to actually find an explicit formula for r as a function of u. This is done in the notes. I won't, I, we won't use it. If we won't use it, so I won't, I won't derive it, but I'll quote it for you at least. The formula is that rij is one half the trace of uh, u dagger times sigma i times u times sigma j. And you can see from this formula that if I, if I take both u and minus, and this is quadratic in u, if I take u and minus u, they give you the same r. That's why two u's and then by sign they map to the same r. You can also show from this formula that r of u1 times r of u2 is equal to r of u1 u2. In other words, although we started out by looking for unitary operators that reproduce the multiplication laws of classical rotations, what we end up getting in the case of the spin one half system is spin one half rotation operators such that the classical rotations reproduce their multiplication laws the other way around. In an important sense, the group SU2 is the more fundamental group, and the SO3 is a derivative group. This is a really the best, the best point of view in quantum mechanics, and it also is, uh, has its uh, virtues even in purely classical problems.
actually, I understand this SU2 group was, was known to Cayley and Klein in the 19th century, even before uh, quantum mechanics came about in this double association. People that do, uh, people that do uh, computer programs to, for example, integrate the uh, equations of motion of a gyroscope, like satellites with a spacecraft or something that's, that's, that's a, a, effectively a free gyroscope. Uh, you need to know how its attitude is a function of time. They don't use SO3, they use SU2 for that, and they have to do this, even though it's a pure classical problem. It's much easier in a computer program. Okay. Uh, so this is double valid representation. Now I mentioned that this is the mathematical part of it. Now the question is what's the physical part of it? The question is that, uh, so you see what this says, it says is anomaly, anomaly, what this says is that if I take a spin one half system like an electron and I rotate it by an angle of 2 pi, the electron state doesn't return to itself, but it rather suffers a phase change of minus 1. And the question is, and you might say, well, that's just a phase. It is just a phase, but is it physical? And the answer is that it is physical. So here's the, here's the situation. The size of the electron state in a rotation by any axis, by an angle of 2 pi, acting on it, takes us into the negative state. And does this have physical consequences? Um, it does. Uh, the, uh, it's been verified experimentally that this is true. Uh, it's, it's discussed in Sakurai's book. I'll go into slightly more detail than he does. Um, the, uh, the best experiments for studying um, this time, uh, the best experimental situation for studying this type of phenomenon is the, um, uh, involves, um, uh, involves uh, uh, effectively Bragg scattering of uh, neutrons, thermal neutrons, by means of a silicon crystal. Uh, this was done back in the 1970s. Uh, with the, uh, because of semiconductor technology, it's now possible to create uh, silicon crystals uh, in which the, uh, the lattice of atoms in the silicon crystal is uniform without any defects or breaks in it for over a considerable distance and measured in centimeters, even though there's 10 to the, minus, 10 to the 8 something lattice spacing in every, in every centimeter. So from the standpoint of diffraction gratings, this creates a very good diffraction rating. You know, diffraction gratings are spoiled if, this, if the spacing isn't exactly perfect. In any case, uh, what you do is you have a beam of thermal neutrons coming in like this into this, into this crystal. Uh, neutrons are produced by nuclear reactors that come from the fission of uranium. Uh, when they're produced, they typically have energies of something like uh, an order of a million electron volts uh, from, the, from the fission. But um, you create thermal neutrons, which have energies of you know, 300 kelvins, which is 1 40th of an electron volt. You create them by taking the high energy neutrons and then letting them diffuse through a substance that has a lot of hydrogen in it. Typically, paraffin is used for this. And uh, what, what comes out are, uh, so they bang into the hydrogen to a slow down the room temperature, and so you get, you get a gas of, of uh, room temperature neutrons. And by running it through holes in collimators, you can turn this into a beam. Now, of course, they have varying energies. They're distributed by the Boltzmann distribution. But you can select out a given energy in various ways. In fact, one of the ways to do it is to use the crystal as a diffraction grating, and then the different energies come off at different different angles that, as you get to know about diffraction gratings. It's Bragg scattering, basically, in the crystal. Uh, so by picking an angle, you pick an energy. Uh, the, uh, it turns out the wavelength of thermal neutrons is comparable to the uh, spacing of the atoms inside the silicon crystal. It's about one, one angstrom per so. <laughs> So the result is, is that when these, this neutron beam passes into the crystal, neutrons of a, of a definite energy go off in definite angles like this. And um, people did very interesting experiments. Uh, in the first place, just looking for interference, uh, basically testing the boys' ideas about wave, quantum waves. If you have a second uh, crystal like this, then you'll get rank scattering going back in the, in, the, in the other angle coming back together and recombine the beams. So this is like what you do in optics with a beam splitter, you know, using half silvered mirrors and then recombining beams, but this is not about neutrons. Uh, so what you do is, amongst, besides, besides testing things like double slit experiments, there's something else you can do here. And you can insert in one of these beams the region in which a magnetic field can be applied. Magnetic field causes the neutron spin to precess, precess. The amount of precession depends on how long it spends in the magnetic field and how strong the magnetic field is. 
Uh, but the spin precession is actually a rotation operator. As, as we'll see later on, it's, it's actually a rotation operator. Exactly the performance that vary here. Uh, it's, a, it's a rotation in which the see, the variable is here. I guess I erased it. It's the, it's the spin rotation uh, with some axis. The axis is the direction of the magnetic field and the angle is proportional to time. So by adjusting the magnetic field strength, you can make the angle equal to 2 pi or any angle you want for the electron passing, excuse me, the neutron passing through this, this magnetic field region. If you turn the magnetic field off, there's no, there's no rotation at all. So by doing this, you introduce, by, by rotating by 2 pi, for example, if the theory is correct, you introduce a phase shift of minus 1 in one of these two beams compared to the phase shift that you'd have if there was no magnetic field. And if that phase shift is really there, then you should see a shift in the interference fringes where these two beams come together. And let me just say that the experiments fully confirm the, the, uh, the predictions that uh, of this formula here, rotating a neutron by 2 pi really does change its phase by minus 1. So this is real, uh, and it's, it's, um, uh, it has to be taken uh, seriously. That's the basic story and double value representation of the rotations by means of spin rotations. It's one of the most important facts about spin rotations. Uh, I don't have too much more to say about spin rotations, maybe a few things, which I'll do next time. Uh, and then uh, the next step, uh, to summarize work just a little bit where we've been and where we're going to go, where we've been was we developed a general strategy for finding rotation operators. It is to find the angular momentum first. It has to satisfy the right commutation relations. Then we guessed what that was for spin one half systems and worked out some of the properties. The next step after we're done with spin one half systems is to solve that representation problem in all generality. That is to say, to find all possible quantum operators J which satisfy permission operators which satisfy the angular momentum commutation relations and then find that the rotation operators are that correspond to them.